So hello again, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mustafa Youssef, who is a professor at Ijast University uh, in Egypt. Uh, Dr. Mustafa has been working on uh, many subjects, among which location awareness, um, localization. He has developed the CellSense system for cellular localization, the Deja Vu system for energy efficient replacement of GPS. He also introduced the concept of device free localization, where an entity can be tracked without carrying any devices. His, works, uh, his work has attracted millions in funding. Professor Youssef has more than 100 publications in top journals and conferences with thousands of citations. Um, he has been, his work has been awarded many awards. Um, his, uh, pa a paper of his was um, the got the spotlight uh, mansion for IEEE, at, uh, IEEE transactions on parallel and distributed systems. Uh, his works have been either awarded best paper awards or, or have been runner-ups uh, in many conferences, including, for example, Globcom. He has been awarded several patents and has uh, other patents pending. His work is regularly cited in um, general media such as New York Times and Scientific American Magazine. He is associate editor of many uh, important journals, uh, such as I, uh, uh, ACM Transactional and Spatial, uh, Spatial Algorithms and Systems, TSCAC. Uh, he has been on the TPC of many uh, uh, important conferences, such as Infocom, Percom, Mobicom, Mobisys. Uh, the students of Dr. Youssef uh, have many accomplishments. For example, uh, a student of his go, got the uh, Young Innovator Award, uh, it, and uh, a student of his was also in the second place in ACM 2009 Sigmol Undergraduate Research Competition. Um, without you, <laughs> I, I let you uh, have the pleasure of hearing at the talk of Dr. Youssef. Thanks, Maya, I appreciate it. Uh, should I use both or one of them is? Okay. So thanks for attending the talk. Uh, today I'm going to share with you our vision on sensorless sensing, where we believe that this is the future of ubiquitous uh, context awareness. This is a joint work with a large number of colleagues and students over the year to whom I'm indebted. So as we know, sensor networks have been there for a large number of years, and they have many successes in different application domains, such as uh, herd monitoring, precision agriculture, water quality monitoring, and so on. What is common between all the current sensor network applications that we know is that they require special hardware. You need a sensor. And this sensor needs to be attached to, to the object being sensed. So for example, here you have around the cattle neck, the sensor that is attached to it, and then you can monitor this. You have this device to monitor the quality of the water, these devices to monitor your field, and so on. So this is traditional sensor networks have been successful, and so on. In parallel, as we know, wireless networks have been gaining momentum. We have Wi-Fi networks everywhere, uh, Bluetooth, uh, cellular, FM, we are talking about 4G, 5G, and so on. So wireless networks are there, around us every day, they are there to stay, and they are repla replacing their counterpart wired network. So the natural question that comes to mind is, can we leverage these ubiquitous wireless networks to provide ubiquitous sensing? And this is what we call device-free sensorless sensing. So the idea is, for example, today you have Wi-Fi network installed in your hotel, you are using it to browse the internet to check your email, to check your social network account. During the night, you are using the same network without any extra hardware to do intrusion detection. How can I do this? So imagine this room, for example, is supposed to be empty. No one is there during the night. When someone enters the room, he or she affects the signal strength. And by analyzing the changes in the signal strength, we can detect that someone has entered the room. So we can do intrusion detection using the ambient Wi-Fi signal. It doesn't stop there. What you can do further is you do tracking. 
I can know that the person moved from this room to another room, then went to the reception, and so on. Again, I remind you that this is tracking the person without he or she carrying any devices. Just by analyzing their effect on the ambient RF signals that are, uh, exist everywhere. The, uh, this is an example of an actual system we deployed in our university building. You can see that two persons are moving and we're tracking the point cloud is a particle filter showing the location of the two persons just by using the Wi-Fi network installed in the building. So by using your Wi-Fi network, you can track the people movement inside the building without using any special hardware. So there are different functionalities of this sensorless sensing paradigm. We talked about detection, binary detection. Is there someone or not in the area of interest? You can do tracking where you track the person inside the area of interest. And most interestingly and most challenging is identification. Can I know the identity of the person, who the person is? Can I know their characteristics, what they are doing? It's more challenging, of course, but it's interesting. It has a, low, uh, a long list of research uh, potentials to contribute to. So how this concept of sensorless sensing or device-free uh, detection, tracking, identification can be useful on? There is a, lo a large number of applications. I mentioned the intrusion detection. For your home, you can do it on the border, again, where you can use a single wireless link to detect intruders who are trying to cross uh, the border. You can use it in smart homes, for example, where uh, you automatically turn on or off the EC based on detecting if there are humans or not inside uh, your home. You can do it for gesture recognition, road traffic estimation, mobile health care, smoke detection, material identification, and the list of applications keeps growing each day. So in the rest of my talk, I'll give you uh, an idea about the basic concept, how it works, and uh, especially in detection and tracking, which is, has been there for a long uh, term. And then I'll talk about the identification function, which as I mentioned, more challenging and more interesting. And it's the current uh, state of the art in this interesting field. And finally, I conclude my talk by some future direction of research Hopefully, uh, it will be interesting to the attendees. So we started this uh, concept of device-free localization actually some time ago as a challenges paper in Mobicon 2007. At that time, we didn't know if the concept is going to work or not. So we just were proposing this idea as a challenge, as a new uh, domain of research to the research community, and we showed some feasibility experiments. So this... Uh, figure shows the basic system architecture for our system. It needs RF signal transmitters. These can be your standard Wi-Fi router inside your home. And you need monitoring points that record the signal transmitted from the transmitters. These monitoring points, for example, can be your standard laptop that has a Wi-Fi chip that can listen to a Wi-Fi signal, can be your cell phone or any Wi-Fi enabled device. So what happens is that you signal transmitters are continuously propagating Wi-Fi signals. These signals are captured by your monitoring point like laptops or cell phones, and they are transmitted to an application server where your algorithm, the logic that detects and the track and identify what's going on is performed. And based on this, you detect events and you send alerts, alerts over the internet through SMS or emails to involved parts. So as I mentioned, we didn't know whether it's going to work or not, so we set up a very simple experiment. Actually, this is a side note, we performed this inside a bank vault. So in our, uh, near to our universities, we had a bank vault, so we went inside the bank vault, and the reason to do that is to make sure there is no outside RF interference. Since we didn't know it's going to work or not, we wanted to make sure there is no RF signal coming from uh, outside. So the simple experience we had is that we had two uh, Wi-Fi access points and two laptops, and we have four different locations inside the room separated by three feet apart, about one meter apart. And what we did is that a person comes, stand at each of one of these four locations, and there is a fifth state, which is a silence event. No one inside the room. So we wanted to differentiate between these five different states the silent states, and the person standing at these four different locations. So 
what you are showing here is that since we have two transmitters and two receivers, we have a total of four different data streams. One stream for each transmitter at each receiver. And this is what is drawn on the right. And the vertical uh, CN lines represent the five different events. When the person is standing at location one, two, three, four, and the silence event when no one is inside the area of interest. And we repeat the experiment twice just to make sure that our algorithms are uh, working fine. So just by eye, what you can see is that when the person is standing at different locations, there is different signal behavior. So yes, visually I can do it. And what you can notice also is that each stream by itself is very noisy. So if you want to do it, it's going up and down, of course, based on the presence of people in the area of interest. So it's very noisy, it can uh, cause a lot of false positives and false negatives, but hopefully we have a large number of streams, a large number of these streams that we can fuse together to increase our reliability and detection accuracy. The analogy I always give is it's similar to the human brain. Each neuron in our brain is very limited in capabilities, but the large numbers, the billions of neurons inside our head, is what gives us our human intelligence. So similarly here, each stream by itself is very noisy, but we have a large number of them. Typically, for example, in our campus, you can, at each location, you can hear up to 35 access points. So if you hear 35 access point transmitters, you have, say, 10 laptops, you have 30, 350 data streams. So this is a lot of data. If you fuse them and do uh, anomaly detection techniques and so on, you can get very reliable detection. So the problem we wanted to solve is, if I give the, you these four different data streams, can I have an algorithm that can detect these five different events? And the way we do it, there are a lot of algorithms, of course, to do that. But at this time, it was very initial. We used a very simple techniques based on the signal variance. And the idea is, when the, there is silence, when you are in the silent state, you expect that the signal is not changing at all. So the variance of the signal strength should be low. When someone enters the area of interest, the signal will start changing and your variance will increase. So if you calculate your, you are moving a variance over a moving window and you draw it over time and you put a threshold on the variance, if your variance is high, you detect there is an event. If the variance is low, you say that we are in the silent state. So this is the basic uh, idea. There are, of course, a number of parameters here, like what threshold I should use. And there is, uh, of course, you have redundancy. So as I mentioned here, we have four data streams. So how to fuse them together? So we have a parameter, how many of these streams we fuse together? Another thing is, uh, most probably, the detection of the, each individual stream will not happen concurrently at the same time. So how can we take this into account so we introduced Another parameter, which is the time buffer, which is basically if the two events occur within this time buffer, you, you declare that these two events occurred simultaneously. So these are different parameters to make it more uh, practical, but let's see how it performs when you apply this simple algorithm on one stream. So this figure shows the results, the moving variance over just one stream, and you can see just by using this simple technique, you have spikes at the points where the events occurred. So this is very promising, but you can notice also that at some events, the variance is still not above the threshold, so it cannot be detected. But the good news is that you have three other different streams. So if you fuse the other streams, hopefully they will have spikes at these points and you would be able to detect the different events with very high accuracy. So uh, this slide shows the effect of different parameters on accuracy, I'm not going into the details, but what you can see is that for certain values of the parameters, you can get zero false positive rate and 100% probability of detection, which is uh, very good. And this is a very easy problem. If you are interested, I gave this part of this talk at a Google Tech Talk. It's available online on YouTube. So if you Google Mustafa Youssef uh, Tech Talks, you will have a real life demo of the detection functionality where you can see it's working with very high accuracy. So uh, we have other demos uh, during the talk, but for now, for the sake of time, I'm moving on. So the second uh, problem is tracking. It is not just binary detections that I want to know is there someone there or not. I want to track the person inside the area of interest. So what I'm showing here is the signal strength uh, received at a very small area, as uh, small as maybe uh, six feet by uh, four feet. 
So in this very small uh, area, you can see that the signal strength changes significantly with changes up to 15 dBms. So in order to do tracking, you need a relation between signal strength and distance, but this relation is very dynamic and very complex. So how can we solve this? We use the concept of fingerprinting. So by a fingerprint, you mean that if I want to track a person inside this area, for example, I go to different locations and to collect the signature or fingerprint of the signal at this particular location. So I store the signature at this particular location. During the online phase, I don't know where I am, so I compare what's the signal I'm getting now with what I stored in the fingerprint. And I return the most probable location as my estimated location. So this is a known technique. It has been used in device-based localization, not device-free. So let me give you an idea about device-based radio map construction. So in device-based tracking, you have a device and you want to track this device inside the area of interest. So what we do is that you want to construct a fingerprint. You go to different locations in the area of interest. So you, for example, you go and stand there and you collect the signal strength you are hearing from different access points and you construct the signal strength histogram. So here I'm hearing three access points. I will construct three different histograms. During the tracking, I compare what I am hearing and calculate the probability using this histogram to estimate the most probable location. So how does this change if I do device-free localization? I want to track the person without carrying any devices. So now the person is not carrying any devices and I want to construct a fingerprint. So the person goes and stands at different locations in the area of interest. And the device is here, sorry. The devices here is not with the person, but they are installed in the infrastructure. So these are the access point in the building and the laptops that are left, for example, on the desks of the people during the night or the desktops that are Wi-Fi enabled. So what happens is that instead of recording at the device, I record when the person is standing here, what is her effect on the signal strength at the different infrastructure devices. So here I have two transmitters, two receivers. I have four different data streams. I construct the, signal, the histograms for the four different data streams when the person is standing at this particular location. I repeat it for different locations in the area of interest, and I store this in my a database, which is the fingerprint of the building. How do I do tracking during the online phase? I can use, for example, standard Bayesian uh, inference. So my goal is to find the most probable location, given the received signal strength. And you can show this is equivalent to Bayesian inversion. It's the location that maximizes the received signal giving the, each location in the fingerprint, which are, can be obtained from the histograms we constructed during the offline phase. So how well can we perform using this uh, technique? In our very simple experiment where we had four different locations to uh, differentiate from, we can achieve more than 86% uh, accuracy in uh, uh, determining the actual location. So we can get the exact location of the person more than 86% of the time, and our average accuracy is less than about half a foot uh, localization, which is very accurate, but again, the experiment was very simple at that time. So this was maybe about 10 years ago, and the field has developed significantly since that time in terms of uh, detection and tracking. So as I mentioned, uh, these are different directions that we and other groups has worked on over the years, including uh, robust detection. How can I do the detection in different environments without tuning the parameters in each environment? So we had this uh, work where we automatically adapt uh, the parameters of the system uh, as the uh, environment changes. Another dimension is multi-entity detection and uh, localization. And the problem of multi-entity detection and localization is the scalability of the fingerprint. So if you want to build a fingerprint for two persons, what will happen is that you need to get all the combinations of the two persons when they are standing at different locations uh, at the same time. And you can see that this grows exponentially with the number of people. It doesn't scale. So this is challenging, of course, and what we did is we converted this, we came up with a solution that changes this exponential complexity to a linear one. So you just train with a single person, and you can uh, use superposition, for example, to uh, 
build a multi-entity fingerprint using a single entity uh, fingerprint. Another direction is using single transmitter receiver. So in many cases, for example, in homes, you don't have a large number of access points or laptops. So how can you uh, perform accurate detection and tracking just using one access point and one laptop? So this is also an another interesting research direction. And the last one is the automatic uh, fingerprint construction. So in order to, f to build the fingerprint, it's a high overhead process because the person has to go and stand at different locations in the area of interest. So it's labor intensive. So how can we reduce this fingerprint construction overhead? So one approach, for example, is to use CAD tools, computer-aided uh, tools, where, for example, you enter the building uh, floor plan, the location of the access points, and you run ray tracing techniques, for example, to automatically generate the fingerprint. So these are different directions for uh, detection and the tracking that has been performed over the last uh, few, uh, few years. So uh, moving on, we'll uh, talk about the identification problem, which is, as I mentioned, more challenging, more interesting, and one of the current state of the art in this interesting area of research. So by uh, sensorless sensing identification, what we are referring to here is how can I identify the characteristics of the object being tracked. So I detected that there is an object in the area of interest. I can track this uh, object inside the area of interest. Now I know to know, I need to know some characteristics about this object. Can I know its identity, for example? Maybe it's a hard problem to know if this is Mustafa or John or anyone else, but maybe I can get some characteristics of it. So for example, in the border protection or the uh, scenario, I can differentiate between a tank, for example, and the human, because hopefully their signature on the signal strength will be completely different. So I can get some idea about the properties of the object. Some of the examples of these include gesture recognition, what the person is doing, for example, uh, breathing rate detection, road traffic estimation, uh, elderly fall detection, so if you are, you can monitor the elderly, for example, inside homes, and you can detect that the person falls just based on the changes in the Wi-Fi signal installed at home. Uh, some other colleagues have used it in wireless keyboard. So you just print a keyboard. You don't have a physical keyboard. You print a keyboard using your printer. And you, by changing your, detecting your finger position over the paper, you can detect what key is being pressed and use a wireless keyboard. Speech detection, you can use directional antenna, point them to the lips of the person, and you can detect what words they are uh, saying. A smoke detection, for example, you can detect if someone is smoking inside the restroom or not. Uh, material identification, trying to differentiate between different uh, materials of objects, again, based on standard Wi-Fi equipment. And the list, as you see, these applications, very interesting, very fancy, and the list keep increasing each day. So th for the uh, sake of time, I'll just talk about the first two applications, which are from our uh, group. And if you are interested, I'll give pointers at the end uh, for more uh, papers and uh, news videos about the other topics. So the first system I'm going to talk about is the YGIST system where we provide ubiquitous uh, Wi-Fi based uh, gesture recognition using the sensorless sensing ID. So currently the typical way of interacting with your cell phone is through the touch screen. You need to click on the screen, swap and so on to control your phone. However, this may not be feasible at all time. So for example, if you are in a cold place, you are wearing gloves, it is not uh, easy to interact with the uh, phone screen when you are wearing gloves. In some other cases, your hands may be wet or dirty, you cannot touch the screen. So in order to solve that, some high-end phones, for example, Samsung S9, have special infrared sensors installed on the phone to detect your hand motion. So what you can do is that you can hover your hand in the air, and the sensors can detect your hand movement and take actions based on what you, your interaction with the phone. But in order to do this, you have to have a high-end phone that can afford to install special sensors to detect your hand sensors. So how can we make this more ubiquitous and make it affordable to more phones? Again, using the sensorless sensing, using the standard Wi-Fi signal. So the idea is almost every smartphone today comes with Wi-Fi. So by analyzing the changes in the Wi-Fi signal, 
we can perform gesture recognition and the control of your device. And now we can have this gesture recognition for any Wi-Fi enabled device. You don't have to have special sensors in your device to do gesture recognition. Of course, there are a number of challenges that need to be addressed. So for example, we, ne we needed our system to work without any training. You just install some software from your app store and you have your device uh, gesture uh, enabled. We needed to be robust to different user uh, interference. So I'm controlling my device, but people are moving around. And these people affect the Wi-Fi signal. So if they affect the Wi-Fi signal, I don't them want their movement to control my device. So how can I separate my interaction with the device from the people who are moving around? So this is another challenge. And of course, I need to be energy efficient. I don't want to drain the battery of my device while I'm doing this gesture recognition functionality. So the basic idea we build on, again, is that our presence as humans in Wi-Fi field affects the Wi-Fi signal. You can, of course, try it. If you run your phone and you put your hand over the phone, you will find that your Wi-Fi signal drops. The bars of the Wi-Fi will drop because our human, since our body is made more than 60% of water, and water resonance frequency is 2.4 gigahertz, the same frequency used in Wi-Fi uh, chips, our presence affects the Wi-Fi signal. So if you put your hand over the phone, the Wi-Fi signal will drop. If you move it away, the Wi-Fi signal will become strong again. So this figure, what it shows is that the Wi-Fi signal, when I interacted my device by this action. So I put my hand, remove it, put my hand, and remove it. So what you can see from this figure is that I did it twice in the first time. Can you tell me how many times I did it here and how many times I did it there without looking into the number? So it's clear that you have three here signal going up and down. So it means I did it three times in the first time and I did it twice in the second time. Not only that, you can see that since the frequency here is higher than the frequency there, I did it more quicker here than I did it here. So not only I can detect what gesture I did, that I did this gesture, but I can get some other attributes of the gesture too. I can get the count, how many times I did it, and I can get the speed, how fast I did this particular gesture. So just by analyzing the signal, I can get the gesture and its attributes. How can this be uh, useful? Some of the interesting application we thought of and our colleagues told us about is, for example, you can use your phone as a virtual mouse. So the idea is you can swipe your hand over the phone to move the mouse, and you can do click and double click, leveraging the Wi-Fi chip in your phone. So you don't need to buy any external mouse, just use your phone as a virtual mouse. Another interesting application is in gaming, for example. So if you have a basketball game, what you can do is you can do fast dribble or slow dribble just based on your movement over the phone. So it becomes more interactive uh, gaming experience to the user, leveraging the standard Wi-Fi signal. So time for a demo. So uh, this demo we showed in real time in Infocom 2015. There were many people around us and we were afraid it was the first time to experiment the system when hundreds of people are around you. But it works remarkably well, and maybe later we can discuss why it works well when there are many people around. What I'm going to show you is a media controlling, a media player application running on your phone using gesture recognition. So I can do like this, for example, to pause the media player. I can do it again to start it playing the song again. I can do like this to move to the next song, and so on. So what you are showing uh, is the uh, cell phone. We don't need the laptop, but the laptop is just showing us what signal, the changes in the Wi-Fi signal that is going on on the phone. So the user now is doing a pause. You can see the effect of the user it just a drip in the signal, and it paused now. I think next it will do move to next song. It's over, we can repeat it. So again, the phone is running a media player application. I'm controlling it with hand gestures, and the laptop is just there to show what's happening to the Wi-Fi signal when the user is interacting with uh, the device. There is some delay because we are relaying the signal to the laptop for display, and this takes some time, but in real time, as I mentioned, you don't need 
as a laptop at all. Let's do it again. So now it's giving a gesture. To move to the next song, and now you see that the song has changed, and now it will make another gesture to do a pause. So this is a quick overview of the system architecture, how we do it. So we start from the bottom, where we break the signal into different signal primitives. So any signal would be a rising edge, or a falling edge, or a pause. So the signal uh, level is changing from low to high, or from high to low, or just not changing. And then we combine these different primitives into gestures. And we have the concept of gesture families, and the idea here is that you have inherent ambiguity. So for example, if I put my hand like this and move it up, the signal will change from low to high. It's the same effect if I put my hand like this and move to the right or to the left. Because again, the signal is strong here, sorry, weak, because my hand is blocking the signal. And then when I move my hand again, it will be strong. So I cannot differentiate between doing this and doing this. So that's why we define these gesture families, where each family contains the gestures I cannot differentiate from each other. And the application developer has to choose for each action in her application, one gesture member from each family. So we can identify up to six gesture families. We have follow-up work where we leverage the channel state information to provide much finer grained accuracy. I think it has just been accepted in IEEE TMC last week. But this gives you the basic idea, and using our, the details, of course, are in our Infocom paper, but the accuracy, we showed that you can get 96% accuracy of detecting or separating these different sex gestures when people are around and moving, which is, of course, very good, and it was verified in a real-time demo in Infocom. Moving on, another interesting application where we leverage this uh, sensorless uh, sensing uh, concept is the UB breeze where we try to do ubiquitous non-invasive Wi-Fi wi based breathing estimation. So here we are trying to estimate the breathing rate using the ambient Wi-Fi signal. How we do it? Before we say how we do it, let's take a while to talk about why it is important. So when you started working uh, on this problem, we thought that the breathing rate is very close or similar to the heart rate. Of course, they are correlated because your breathing rate is correlated with your heart beating rate, but they are two separate uh, vital signs, and each one of them can be an indicator for different health conditions. So for example, your breathing rate can, uh, or changes in breathing rate or problems in breathing rate can uh, be an indicator of serious health problems like SIDS, which sudden infant death uh, syndrome, uh, apnea, uh, which is the cessation of breathing and so on. Sudden infant death syndrome is unfortunately when newborn babies are sleeping, they may sleep over their tummy and their breathing stops and unfortunately they die. And actually, this is one of the leading causes of death of newborn infants in the USA. Uh, so if you can detect and estimate the breathing rate, hopefully you can prevent this from happening. Apnea is another health condition where the person's breathing stops while he or she are sleeping at night. And the problem with this is that it happens while the person is sleeping. So you cannot detect it until it's later, it has progressed and it causes more serious health problems. So typically in order to detect apnea, what happens is the person has to go to the hospital and stay there over 48 hours under monitoring with medical devices attached to them so that they can monitor their breathing while sleeping. So hopefully if you have a Wi-Fi based system that can do that, you can do this monitoring at the convenience of your home. You can sleep at your home and your Wi-Fi network is monitoring your uh, breathing and sleeping uh, better. So these are the current techniques in uh, commercial or even literature research. So some techniques attach something to the infant leg to monitor their uh, breathing. Of course, you can see that it is very inconvenient because you have to attach something to the foot of the baby. Uh, another, as I mentioned, is that you have to go to the hospital and wear medical devices, which is again inconvenient. Some of our colleagues in literature use the standard sensor network. You can see that these are uh, TELUS B modes 
if you know them installed in high density around the person, and by analyzing the changes in the signal, you can detect the breathing rate. What we propose to do is to use standard Wi-Fi equipment to do the same thing. And the basic idea is, again, if you hold your uh, mobile phone, for example, that has Wi-Fi chip, you place it in your chest, and you are standing so that the line of sight between your Wi-Fi router and the uh, cell phone is going through the chest, the minor movement of the chest while breathing affects your signal strength and it modulates the Wi-Fi signal. So as you are breathing and the line of sight is going through your chest, the movement of your chest modulates the RF, the RF signal. By analyzing the changes in the RF signals, we can estimate the breathing rate. So what we are showing here, the top blue signal is the Wi-Fi signal received when the line of sight is going through the chest and the bottom uh, red signal is the breathing signal extracted from this Wi-Fi signal. You can see here there is no clear pattern for breathing here, but after we do our processing, we can see the periodic breathing uh, signal. Of course, this has an advantage, as I mentioned, that now it's non-intrusive. You don't have to attach anything to the human body. It works with any Wi-Fi enabled device, so you can do it at home. If there is an accident on the road, you can measure the breathing rate using anyone's cell phone and so on, and you can do it anywhere. So this has a huge advantage. This is a quick overview of the system architecture. You start by collecting the signal from your Wi-Fi routing, router going through the chest on your mobile phone and any laptop in the area of interest. Then you do some signal processing techniques to clean the signal and extract the breathing uh, rate. In parallel, you can run uh, higher level uh, intelligent algorithms to detect apnea, for example, that the breathing has stopped. And if you detect that, you can even display it on a monitor or send an SMS or email to people of interest saying there is a problem, go check on this uh, person. Of course, we need to do also a lot of outlier detection and signal uh, enhancement uh, technique. Let me show you a demo of that. So what we are showing here at the top, oops. So, so the video is not running, but here actually you are seeing the Wi-Fi signal at the top. The second one is the spectrum of the signal. Here is after we removed the noise, and the last one is the extracted breathing uh, signal. And when the breathing stops, you raise an alarm and send it to the user. Here, the actual breathing rate was 18 breaths per minute, and that is estimated, I think, was 17.8 or something. So it's very um, accurate using your standard Wi-Fi device. Of course, there is a caveat here. It has to be very controlled that the person has to be in the line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver. But again, it's a solution that works with, with your standard Wi-Fi equipment. So the last uh, thing I'm going to talk about in my talk is what are the current active uh, trends in this interesting research uh, area. So as we know, and as I've been listening to different talks in the conference, IoT, of course, is booming. Here, all your devices will be connected to the internet to re relay their signals or get command or control information from uh, people. So you have a lot of devices that are wirelessly connected, and these old devices can be used, their signals can be used for sensorless sensing. So provide an opportunity that you have a lot of devices, you should do more applications, higher uh, quality estimates, but also you need to handle the scale of these different devices and their different qualities. So each sensor or dev IoT device has different characteristics, so how can I fuse all of these together with these heterogeneous characteristics? Of course, deep learning now is gaining momentum, so with the availability of large scale and larger amounts of data, I can leverage deep learning techniques to even do uh, automatically detect features that can provide higher accuracy. Wearable devices, we are wearing smart watches, smart glasses, and so on, and these are connected to cell phones. So actually, you are monitoring the persons through uh, her own devices. My uh, cell phone is listening to the signal of the watch, I can listen to uh, the signal and analyze them to detect new things. For example, one thing is to control my watch using my gesture uh, recognition. So if I'm doing this with the watch, I'm affecting the Bluetooth connection between the watch and the phone, so I can use this to control the watch without using any other sensors. 
I can use it for biometric security uh, for wearables. So for example, I can do a specific uh, movement of my hand to unlock my watch because the movement will affect the signal received at my phone and by analyzing the signal, I can detect that this is the person pattern used to generate these uh, gestures. Uh, novel applications, I showed you some fancy ones. Other fancy ones including the emotion recognition where we want to, actually there are some papers that shows that the emotion, for example, can be extracted based on extracting the vital signs like heart rate and the breathing rate. So if you can detect the heart rate and breathing rate, you can correlate this with, with whether the person is happy, angry, or sad. And you can use this for different applications, and the list of applications goes on uh, and on. So uh, thank you for uh, your interest during the talk. For more applications, papers, videos, and media coverage, please go to our website or different uh, social media outlets. Thank you. There's another one here if you want. Thanks. Um, oh, hi, I was wondering with, uh, um, with your gesture recognition you had, right? Where you, where you showed us that you can do these things, right? right. Isn't it a security nightmare? Because um, if I have a jammer, so if you're doing things like this, right, and you saw these dips in your signal, and I have a jammer, I should be able to do similar things. So I can remotely control any device um, with a jammer or with a software defined radio. Isn't that a nightmare? Yeah, actually, this is a very interesting point that we haven't thought of. But yes, so the question is if by analyzing the changes of the signal strengths, you can control the device any attacker can simulate or can change the signal strength and then control your device. So in the face of it, yes, it seems uh, a possible attack and it requires a, a look, a deeper look from the research community. So yes, I agree. Of course, you can do, try to do some uh, countermeasures for that. So for example, you can do this security or pre-authentication before accepting the analysis or the changes in the signal. But yes, this is a very interesting point. Thanks for bringing this up. Another question? All right. Um, yeah, my question is about the accuracy, right? So uh, I noticed that uh, 10 years ago, you have conducted this experiment saying that uh, the accuracy is already approaching like uh, 90%. But I believe that is under a very you know, controlled environment. So my question is that uh, in a real environment, if you're using signals like uh, in ISM band, like uh, Wi-Fi, it's interference everywhere, all right? So how accurate that we, uh, I mean, you can do that. And uh, that, I mean, affects its how practical it is, right? And also you mentioned something like uh, fingerprinting. As far as I know, that's a very expensive process. You have to fingerprint every time there is any change you know, so how practical, I, I mean, that's yes. the solution is. Very good and valid question. So the question is about practicality. So as I mentioned, when we started, we didn't know whether it's going to work or not. So we have a very limited scenario, as you saw, and we showed it can get very high accuracy. But how does it perform well in general setting? So actually, it depends on the particular functionality and the application. So for example, identification, just detecting if there is someone there or not, you can do it very accurately in practical uh, scenarios. And as I said, you can show a demo in uh, my uh, TikTok uh, video. You can do it, and the problem is simple. And the reason for that, it's a, again a controlled scenario, meaning intrusion detection by definition, you are doing it in area where no one is supposed to be there. So your application domain is by definition a simple one. So if there is no one there, someone enters, you can see a clear change in the signal. If you want to do tracking, for example, it's a harder problem, and your accuracy, if you want to do it in a real setting like this, it's a harder problem, you cannot do it. But again, you can do it when you restrict your application domain. I can do it in uh, intrusion detection scenarios, when no one is supposed to be there, so uh, I can track the person accurately in intrusion detection scenario when no one is supposed to be there. If I am during the day, and there are many people around me, it would be hard to track an individual person. But I can do, for example, counting. I can get an estimate 
of the density of the people inside the room using sensorless sensing techniques with high accuracy. Another application, the gesture recognition uh, demo that I showed you, for example, you can do it very accurately when people are around. And as I mentioned, we do it in a live demo in uh, Infocom 2015, where hundreds of people were around, and we ourselves were surprised with the accuracy. And the reason it worked, why it worked well in this particular scenario, for different reasons. First, the application itself, you are interacting with the phone very closely. So your effect is the dominant effect. So even though people are moving around the way, they are not the dominant effect on the signal. The second reason is redundancy. Because your phone is not just listening to one access point, it's listening to a large number of access points. So even if there are some interference on one of the access points, you leverage redundancy to reduce outliers and do robust uh, detection. The third one is that we are using a preamble in our signal. So based on this preamble, you can also reduce the effect of noise so that you can know, know this is not a gesture because it didn't start with the preamble. And you can use also for security reasons. So again, the quick answer to this, it depends on your application uh, scenario and the specific functionality you want uh, to perform. There are still open challenges. That's why it's uh, one of the very active area, actually in location tracking technologies now, which is device-free tracking and identification. So great questions required great effort from the community. Thanks for reading this. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that you call the last two examples uh, device-free because you're using the smartphone as a sensor. Um, so anyway, but my, my main question was actually, have you looked at um, more recent work? Um, because you, you seem to be using uh, signal strengths RSSI, but more recent work has been uh, look, has, has used uh, channel state information of the OFDM signal, uh, which gives you a bit of a radar type um, facility. And we've done some work in this on fall detection, for example, where we, where we actually show that it's quite a lot superior to uh, to RSSI, so I'm just wondering whether this is something that you might have considered in your work as well. Sure, uh, great question. So the first point is, I am calling it sensor device free without device, but I'm using my cell phone. So actually this is debatable, but the idea here, we are using devices, but the difference is I'm using the devices in the infrastructure, not the devices. So the typical example is tracking. So I can track the cell phone, for example, using the GPS chip, or Wi-Fi chip inside the phone. So in this case, it's a device-based tracking because I'm tracking the chip inside the phone. In the device-free scenario, I'm still using laptops and cell phones, but they are not the person, laptop and cell phone. The person is moving in the area of interest without any devices, and I'm using the devices and the infrastructure to do the tracking. So it may be a fancy name, but yes, it's, uh, it's debatable. The second point is using CSI. Actually, I hinted it in one of the applications. So in some of our uh, CSI is channel state information, which is available in some technologies like 11N, for example, where you are not just getting a single value, which is the strength of the signal, but you are getting it on the different carriers. If you are using MIMO technology and OFDM, you can get the signal strength on each subcarrier of the signal. So here, of course, you have a lot more information compared to just using signal strength. So you can provide much higher accuracy. But the uh, caveat here, it is not a major one, but the problem is it is not available in the ABIs of most uh, operating systems. So you need to use a special driver, for example, Intel uh, 5300 wireless card, and it's a driver on Linux in order to get this particular information. But if you have it, you can get higher, higher, more information and, of course, much higher accuracy. I hinted to it in the single transmitter receiver. If you use a single access point, single laptop, we're using CSI in this application. In the gesture recognition, for example, application I mentioned, in Infocom, we're using uh, RSS, the signal strength. But in the journal TMC, IEEE TMC uh, version, we use CSI information to provide finer grain accuracy and direction. Because if you use multiple carrier, you can differentiate if you are going from right to left or left to right, so you can increase your accuracy. So all of these are great ideas. Thanks for bringing them up. Maybe a final question. There is one. So um, two short questions, uh, Mustafa. Uh, one is, uh, have you tried these with different brands of access points and different devices? And uh, I assume that should make some difference. But have you tested that? Right. So of course, the. Uh, 
If you are building a fingerprint, for example, if you change the access point, change anything on the environment, your fingerprint will change. Mm -hmm. So this raises the challenge of how can I handle these differences. So for example, in the YGES, the gesture recognition systems, that's why we use signal uh, detection techniques as compared, for example, to signal processing techniques as compared to using classifiers. Because for example, classifiers, you are doing something like a fingerprint that you compare against, and this is sensitive to the different hardware. In our systems, if you use signal processing, we use the primitives, rising edge, falling edge, and both. This is, should be independent okay. of the transmit power or the device you are using. Because all of them hopefully will give you this pattern of rising, falling, or both. So you can use the combination of these different techniques mm -hmm. and actually have a lot more challenges to address. Okay. And the other question is, uh, so I assume you, you, uh, you, you assume that there are access points and you receive signals regardless of you are connected or not, right? Uh, now let's assume that there's no access point. Can you still do this by just relying on the probe requests that are sent from the phone to, add, to look for an access point? Right, so uh, what we are doing here is we are listening to the standard Wi-Fi signals. So you can do it in different modes. So for example, you can do sniffing, you set idle and listen to all the packets that are transmitted around you. So this is a passive approach. You can do it in a more active approach where, as you mentioned, you send a specific probe request and wait for the access point to send you a probe response. One thing I didn't talk about in my talk, but of course it's relevant to what you're saying also, is the sampling rate. Because the sampling rate will depend on how far the person is moving, so that you need to collect signal strength information according to Nyquist criteria, at least double the rate of movement of the person. So in this case, maybe you need more active sensing, you need the active probing approach, but in, if the person is moving slowly or your events are not changing that fast, you can use a passive uh, sensing technique. Oral, great questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Gam Dr. Youssef, for such an interesting talk. Thank you. Kamal and Kari, if you'd like to join me to give this small token of appreci appreciation to Dr. Youssef. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.